Coming up, the story of the outstanding baseball player Louis Sock Alexis is coming to ESPN. Minnesota invests in tribal relations and meet the new director of the Crazy Horse Memorial Foundation. I am Alia Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is a proud supporter of Indian Country Today. Students at Cronkite News and Gaylord College at the University of Oklahoma cover indigenous communities together. This important work is distributed by more than 100 news organizations. This collaboration provides a much needed boost to coverage of Native American communities nationwide. Learn more at cronkitenews.azpbs.org. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. Amarawa Hopa, thank you for joining us. We start in Alaska where cleanup is underway after a powerful storm hit communities along the coast. Over the weekend, the remains of Typhoon Murbach caused rising sea levels, high winds and widespread flooding. The storm knocked out power and sent residents searching for higher ground. On Friday, the National Weather Service took to social media to say the storm was so big that it would take three hours for the sun to set on it. Two villages, Hooper Bay and Golovin, were some of the hardest hit. The town of Nome was also front and center. Videos from the storm show a house floating down a river after it was moved off its foundation. Officials are saying no injuries or deaths were immediately reported. There's a new push to make four landscapes into the, in the United States into national monuments. Earlier this month, an article from the Pew Charitable Trust called on the Biden administration to make these changes. These locations are Kastner Range in Texas, the Camp Hale Continental Divide in Colorado, Avikwame in Nevada, and Moloch Luyuk in California. Making these places national monuments would provide less would provide protections like less development, and this includes for oil and gas projects. Experts say all of these landscapes have a significant meaning to indigenous people. They added that people of color have less access to nearby natural areas than white people, according to a recent study. Secretary of the Interior Deb Holland visited Kastner Range in, in March and advocated to, quote, do more in stopping the loss of nature and wildlife. Now to North Dakota, where citizens of the Mandan, Hidatsa, Arikara Nation are headed to the polls for the tribe's primary election. According to its website, the nation has nearly 17,000 enrolled citizens. However, less than 5,000 citizens live within MHA territory. Since 1986, the tribe has required non-resident voters to return to its tribal lands to vote. That makes voting a challenge for the 73 percent of the total population who live off the reservation. Absentee ballots do exist, but can only be used under certain situations and only by citizens who live in the nation's territory. At a virtual town hall, MHA citizen Joletta Bird Bear said it is a right for all voters to participate in their government. According to ICT, the MHA nation does not currently have any ballot measures active that would target this issue. An indigenous stone fish trap first discovered in 2010 could be the oldest ever found. A team of scientists exploring the underwater region near southeast Alaska discovered it. They estimate it is at least 11,000 years old. The group worked in partnership with the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute and is using artificial intelligence to look for evidence of early human occupation. 
These kinds of traps were commonly used around the world in ancient times, but this is the first one ever confirmed underwater in North America. Clinkett citizen and SHI president Rosita Wurl says the findings push back native occupation of the region by more than 1,000 years. Wurl also noted previous scientific studies that said indigenous people lived in southeast Alaska 10,000 years ago. Prior to this discovery, the oldest known fish traps date from 7,500 to 8,000 years ago. Well, a new addition to the National Football League is increasing Native representation in professional sports. Lumbee citizen Keenan Allen is one of the few Native players in the NFL. The Los Angeles Chargers star is a wide receiver and plays a fundamental role in the team's high-powered offense. Allen was voted the 35th top player out of 100, and last season he made a career-high 106 receptions. The five-time Pro Bowler is entering his 10th season. He hopes to reach Super Bowl 57 next year in Arizona. Allen is well known for route running, creating separation, and getting open against any defense. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Tribal relations in Minnesota just got a boost from the state government. Governor Tim Walz and Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan announced the promotion of Patina Park to Executive Director of Tribal State Relations. She will serve as a direct link between the governor's office and Minnesota's 11 tribal nations and communities. Welcome, Patina, and congratulations to you. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. I understand that you actually started in March 2020 when you were appointed director of tribal state relations, but the pandemic changed things for you. What happened? Yeah, I started on Monday and on Friday, the peacetime emergency was declared. But when I started, I was hired as the director of tribal state relations implementation. And so originally my role was supposed to be very internal facing, working with the agencies, developing consultation policies, et cetera. Um, and then uh, the following week after I started, I became the lead contact between the governor's office and the tribes while we started building um, an unprecedented COVID response uh, across the state. And so um, it became less for like internal facing and more external working one on one with the tribal nations. And so now it's uh, not implementation, it's just recognizing that tribal state relations are a priority and important part of this administration. Can you maybe provide some context in terms of uh, tribal leaders who said that this was a position that they wanted and also explain why they wanted it? Yeah, well, I would never speak on behalf of tribal leadership, but what we have heard from them as we have met and heard secondhand is that there has been a historical kind of lack of regular communication between the governor's office directly with each of the individual tribes. You know, we have the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, which is uh, a collective of the tribes that come together. They meet quarterly um, as well as meet throughout uh, between, but the individual tribal connection with the governor's office was something that tribes had indicated they were lacking. And so this office is really directed towards improving that, uh, building on it, and hopefully we'll have another four years to strategize on how we can make the office permanent, because right now it's just part of this administration. When Governor Walsh leaves and Lieutenant Governor Walsh, uh, or excuse me, Flanagan, we're gone, because uh, we're part of the governor's staff, not part of the state. So I guess if I'm understanding correctly, if the governor and the lieutenant governor didn't win re-election, there's a chance that this office could be disestablished. Yes, because I am part of their staff. And so effective January, what, 16th is when the new administration would step in. Uh, they would get to determine how they would like to engage in tribal state relations. And they'd have to create their own position or agree to adopt this position within their administration. Let's say hypothetically that, um, of course, Governor Tim Walz won his reelection bid and you were granted another term in office. Um, what are the main issues that you're willing to tackle for tribal nations in Minnesota? 
Well, I think our main priority really is to develop the what should this office look like moving forward as far as where it's located within the system, what is its main priorities, roles, even staffing, um, how does it uh, interact with the different uh, agencies since they all have their own tribal liaisons as well, um, you know, to really formulate a strong office with a mission directive and then try to codify it like we codified the executive order last year, uh, making government to government relationship and consultation a state mandate for, for the agencies. So that will outlive Governor Walz. And we'd like to figure out how to do the same thing for the office. And then the office continues to be a policy advisor around tribal affairs for the governor's office. And as we all know, um, tribal affairs connect to almost every single element of state government. Uh, and so ongoing involvement with issues as they pop up to ensure that tribal nations are being considered, that the impact on the tribes is considered at the front end of any action, that when agencies send recommendations or requests to the governor's office, that we're following through to ensure that the tribes were engaged in a meaningful way. And it wasn't just a checkbox of, you know, we called the tribes and that's it. And then, you know, um, things come up. We are adding a staff uh, that starts this week. I'm very excited. And so uh, they'll serve as a Native American Affairs Advisor and we'll further build like how, uh, what role would they fill as far as policy as well as working, you know, directly with the tribal government affairs. And it's a work in progress, but uh, it's exciting work. And it really is uh, energizing to work in administration where, you know, the lieutenant governor's enrolled member, I don't have to do the uh, education component that we all usually have to do when we try to highlight uh, tribal affairs. It, there's just a basic understanding of it now, and so we can get past that and start moving to actions right away. We only have about 30 seconds left here, but I want to ask you about an initiative by Governor Walls, and that's on missing and murdered Indigenous relatives. Can you maybe talk about any new initiatives under that uh, topic? Well, we're excited that we have the first office in the country. Uh, it's located in public safety. Uh, the executive director, Rudy, is already um, posting positions to staff up. And so we're talking about what would an advisory council or group look like. She's already engaged in reaching out to law enforcement agencies and, and kind of looking at old cases. And so I think we have the potential here to kind of lead in this work at a state level and then to plug into the work that's being done at a federal level as well as within other states and tribal nations because you know this issue isn't like limited to Minnesota and it crosses into uh, Canada crosses across you know the country and of course it impacts our tribal nations directly so uh, it's exciting for Julie to be there and start really leading on this work well Patina Park thank you so much thank you Baseball fans might know the name Louis Sock Alexis, but he remains largely unknown to most people. Sock Alexis was an outstanding baseball player. He was from the Penobscot Indian Nation and was left-handed. In 1897, he joined the Cleveland team that was called the Spiders at the time. Years later, the team would change the name to the Indians to honor Sock Alexis. Then, after more than 100 years, the name changed again. His story will be told on ESPN when it brought Podcasts, Deerfoot of the Diamond on September 27th. Joining us to talk about this story is Lance Edmonds. He's the writer and director of the documentary. Welcome, Lance. Thank you. It's great to be here. It's a long story, but tell us about the legacy of Lewis Sock Alexis. 
Yeah, he's um, an incredible baseball player. He played his rookie season in 1897, so way back a, a long time ago. He grew up in Old Town, Maine, on as you said, on the uh, Indian Island, which is the reservation for the Penobscot. And he was an incredible baseball player as a young man and played at Holy Cross, and he played at Notre Dame, and he was a collegiate baseball star. And he ended up getting drafted by the Cleveland team in 1897, and he had a fantastic few months as a as a rookie. Um, he had an incredible rise, but he also had a really steep and precipitous fall after an injury and battle with alcoholism. His career was tragically cut short, um, but it was sort of revived and remembered in the year of 1915 when the Cleveland team was looking to find a new name. And during the time that Sock Alexis played, um, they were known as the Indians. And so they sort of revived that name um, in 1915 and stuck with it for over 100 years. Um, the film tracks the story of, of Lewis and his incredible career and skills as a baseball player, but it also gets into issues surrounding um, using Native American mascots, the Chief Wahoo logo, and other um, issues surrounding the, the team name of Indians, which was initially, uh, uh, which was gone on to change in 2021 to the Guardians um, uh, after many sort of years of, of discussion and protest. And so the film kind of tracks not only his story, but the story of the name and um, sort of honor and tradition and legacy in professional sports. Based off of your research, how did Lewis Sock Alexis feel about the team being called the Indians? Well, when they renamed the team in 1915, um, part of the reason that they had called it that was that he had actually passed away the year before. So he was kind of um, revived in the newspapers and remembered at the time. Um, so he wasn't alive to see the team receive that official designation. Um, but certainly when he played, they were referred to a, as the Indians, as a nickname in the newspapers. Um, we can never really know what was going through his mind because he wasn't interviewed much. And, and one of the sort of tragic things about his story is that, you know, his story was kind of told for him by the by the newspaper writers at the time. And a lot of it was very stere stereotypical, um, very problematic, and he wasn't really necessarily represented in the best of ways. Um, when he played, he was a consummate athlete, a professional, um, was very much um, excited, enthusiastic to be to be playing and, and to be celebrated. But I think looking back, some of the depictions of him uh, weren't necessarily, um, you know, the nicest. And he wasn't treated necessarily the same way that the white players were at the time, being the first, not only the first um, Native American to play baseball, but the first minority at all um, to play in the sport. So he had to contend with a lot of the same stuff that someone like Jackie Robinson did, but that wouldn't be for another 50 years. I want to talk about your documentary, of course, um, being broadcast on ESPN. Can you maybe talk about why it was important um, for non-Native people to learn about this story, in, in your opinion? Yeah, because not only was he a groundbreaker in in, in a way and, and the first, you um, know, and that alone is important for sports history. Um, but I think that also a lot of the discussion around the team name change from the Indians to the Guardians, there was a lot of kind of um, not necessarily misinformation, but I think a lot of people didn't really know the whole story. Um, and his name was brought up a lot to say that the team name was in honor of him. And I think that the name would be invoked, but not necessarily everyone didn't necessarily know the his whole story. Uh, all the details, what a great player he was, um, the troubles he went through, but also the highlights. And so I thought that, you know, since his name was coming up so much in the news and people were discussing Sock Alexis so much, that it would be great to really kind of revive his story and to tell it again and maybe tell it from a new perspective with a little bit of the benefit of hindsight and to kind of bring his historical moment back into present day and kind of inform everyone, you know, this, what the, what the true story really was and, um, you know, allow people to really understand, you know, what his place in history uh, was. And again, this documentary, Deerfoot on the Diamond, airs on September 27th on ESPN. Lance, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.
It's a mission decades in the making, and now there's a new chief executive officer in charge of the Crazy Horse Memorial Foundation. It's just the second week of work for Whitney Rencounter, but he's no stranger to the sculpture being carved or the mission. He joins us today to talk about both. Welcome, Whitney. Hello. Good day. How are you doing? Thanks for having me on today. So let's just jump right in here. Tell us about your past involvement with the Crazy Horse sculpture. Yeah, so the uh, Crazy Horse Memorial Foundation uh, really has the, the mission to uh, move forward and honor the North American tribes and the heritage and preserve and protect, you know. And uh, so I've been involved as a consultant, as my family and I would come out here and educate the visitors that come from all over the world and to share the history of our people and to uh, really share the, the beauty of our culture and so I've been involved uh, for many, for several years uh, in that aspect and then uh, change of role uh, to be more in leadership now. So uh, I've been involved, you know, um, in different portions. I actually, when I was in college many years ago, I received the Crazy Horse Memorial Foundation scholarship. And so that's kind of how things started to connect for me. Uh, but I'm really happy to be able to be here to help lead and uh, push forward the mission of the Crazy Horse Memorial Foundation. Give us some perspective on the carving of the Crazy Horse sculpture. When did it start and when do you expect it to be completed? Well, June 3rd, uh, 2023 would be 75 years anniversary of the, the carving and, and such. Um, but as far as the memorial, as far as the mountain carving itself, uh, because Korchak Tilkuski, who, who started the carving, you know, almost 75 years ago, at the request of uh, Chief Henry Standing Bear and some elders in our area, um, you know, they, they never received any or, or accepted any government or state funds. So everything comes from private private donations uh, from donors and, and support of the admissions and so on and so forth. So because of that, uh, you're relying upon uh, private donations to be able to move forward. So when you want to increase your staff and increase productivity, not just at the, the mountain, but also moving forward with the museum and the, and the uh, university and the other causes that we support uh, that's relying on these donors and, and so on and so forth. So the more donations we get, the more we can expedite and uh, increase our efforts. That's so a, in essence, yeah, oh, go ahead. That's a great segue into my next question, which of course is uh, besides the carving, the foundation also offers educational opportunities. So tell us about those efforts. Yeah, so uh, we have uh, the Indian University of North America, which is part of the foundation. And uh, every year we have two programs. We have a summer program, a seventh gen summer program where we have uh, 30 to 38 students that come to our, our the memorial at, at the university. And they take 12 college credits before after they graduate high school, before they start their next step, whatever university they're attending in the fall. They will earn 12 college credits. They will uh, work an internship, get paid $15 an hour at their internship, but gain valuable experience, especially transitioning from the reservation uh, to their uh, prospective college campus, wherever that's located across the nation. And then we have a fall program where in partnership, so the summer program, they get 12 college credits from Black Hills State University. Our fall program, the students receive a certificate in leadership and sustainability and 15 college credits from South Dakota State University, our partner for that program. And so that's a whole semester program. Uh, and then in the, in the springtime, we have a college fair that we invite 50 plus colleges and students from the area, native students and so on to learn and prepare. So we're really pushing forward in, in uh, promoting education and preparing our students for uh, their future. I want to take a, a moment and ask you what the reaction is from people when they visit um, the, the carving. I've had the chance to see it myself, and I just remember being in complete awe of how this could be built. But I mean, when you're talking to people, what is their reaction? Yeah, you know, one of the things about the carving, and I think this is what our, our uh, late chief, Henry Standing Bear, what he saw, that the mountain carving itself is a draw for people, all races, all cultures, because it's such a huge uh, endeavor that when people get here, they realize it's more than just a carving that's taking place here. It's you learn about the history of native people. You learn about the struggles our ancestors face. But then when you see the carving and you see the beautiful nature 
on the Black Hills of what the, which is the birthplace of our ancestors, the Ocheti, Shakoi, the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota people. People are blown away. Not only the view of the mountain and, and the backdrop of the Black Hills, but I think and also learning about the beautiful culture of native peoples, not only the struggles, but the beauty, the things they never receive in a, in a classroom. And I think that's what we're really excited about, that people get to get an education they will receive nowhere else or very few places unless they study on their own. Uh, and so I think people are really uh, emotional. Uh, very, they become very passionate towards native causes and under, have a better understanding. So it's an area of emotions, but, but for the most part, uh, we're really excited and happy that we can open that door for them to want to learn more about our ancestors and maybe support our causes as well. Absolutely. Well, Whitney Rencounter, thank you so much. Thank you. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.